So first of all, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, if you don't know me, I am the port director here uh, at the port, uh, which is a department of the city and county, and it's a great privilege to be the port director of such an amazing waterfront. Um, I'm just back from a brief stint in Shanghai, China, which is a waterfront of its own making, uh, which does not compare to ours, I am pleased to say, on any number of fronts. Um, uh, but it was fascinating nonetheless. And, uh, and then like, that quickly followed with a trip to uh, Miami, Florida, which is the cruise ship capital of the United States, at least, and, and arguably of the world. Uh, and there I did have a little bit of envy on the maritime side, but the rest of the waterfront just does not compare to are. So uh, as you can tell, I'm very, very proud to be the port director. I want to thank all of you for being part of this uh, historic moment. Um, we have uh, the great privilege of being a waterfront that is constantly reinventing itself, as our city has. Our waterfront is now uh, 152, soon to be 153 years old, I think, if I do my math correctly. Um, and it has seen numerous transitions of our wonderful city and uh, the definition of commerce for our city, the definition of transportation for our city, the definition of um, tourism and visitorship. And we have the opportunity to look forward and see what that is going to mean uh, again for a couple of uh, decades. Just move my stuff out of your way. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'd like to thank all of you for being willing to take a part of it uh, and be a part of it. And I know that um, an, the uh, working group is going to do introductions as part of our agenda tonight. Uh, but I know that a number of you in the back of the room are willing to be on our working group. And we had over 130 applications to be part of this process, which was um, a great gift to the port and a stunning um, process for us all. So I'd just like to ask those of you who are advisory team members, if you could just stand so we could uh, see all of your wonderful, committed, willing, voluntary faces. So thank you all. Can we have a round of applause for them? Um, I'd also like to recognize uh, Commissioner Wu Ho, who has just come into the room, uh, and she's going to say a couple of quick words, and then we will recognize our two chairs. So, Commissioner, may I turn the microphone over to you? <coughs> Thank you. Good evening, and welcome. Um, it's great to see all of you here. Uh, I'm here to represent the Commission, and um, as we looked at the update to the waterfront land use plan, we realized that uh, times have changed, and we really wanted to um, see more uh, public participation, which is great to see all of you here tonight. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's really, really important, uh, because I think the port has moved, when I think about the first plan, which I was not here for, um, the, the, the objective and the, the uh, I guess, the vision at that time was shortly after, as you know, many years after the earthquake, was to kind of reunite the city with its waterfront. But uh, the waterfront now has become really, I think, uh, not just a local asset or a citywide asset. It's become an international destination. It's worldwide. It's known uh, some of the things that we've done here. As you know, in the past few years, <coughs> America's Cup has put everything on the map. And just by seeing all of you here tonight, obviously there's passion uh, to see this very, very sp precious uh, waterfront that we have here in San Francisco and have the... Uh, the f as I have the good fortune to at least be on the commission to also take a look at. I think there's a lot of, um, I think, different issues this time when we look at the waterfront plan. There's obviously the immediate issues of what we have land left to develop, and there's lots of different opinions about that. We want the open space, which many of you I know care about in terms of the necklace of open spaces across the waterfront. But I think on this plan, we have some things that are different from the last time, uh, some longer-term strategic challenges, and you're going to hear a lot about them. Some of them may be a little bit beyond your purview, but I think this is going to be a learning exercise as much as we learn from you. You'll be learning a little bit about some of the things that the port has to face. And what I'm talking about here is obviously climate change um, and sea level rise, uh, the fact that we have an aging uh, seawall infrastructure, in addition to all of the other infrastructure issues that we do face here already, which we had uh, big challenges with our capital plan, 
which we're also trying to address at the same time. And so keeping the port viable in terms of uh, just ongoing, maintaining the port as is, as well as addressing those strategic challenges, I think is very different from what we faced the last time around, because these are real. They're not necessarily immediate, but they are coming, and we know they're coming. And so how do we think about that in terms of uh, some of these issues? And I think we've all become much more environmentally uh, sensitive uh, here, obviously, in San Francisco, but everywhere in the world. But this is a real challenge and issue for us. I think the other thing is, when I'm speaking on the Commission's part, I think it's really important. I personally believe more than one mind is much better than a few minds, and that's the reason why we have you here tonight. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your different points of view. Some of you represent geographies, the neighborhoods, the community of interests, a certain expertise. It's very important to <laughs> fill in those gaps that we don't necessarily all have. Our staff is wonderful, and don't, um, uh, don't uh, mistake me for not believing that we have great staff who work really, really hard and are very, very dedicated, and I'm very impressed with what they do. But there are diverse opinions here. But I also would like to urge all of you um, is that this is not going to be an exercise that all opinions are going to prevail. We will have to make decisions and choices. And hopefully, as I often do, and even as uh, some of our fellow commissioners, uh, sometimes we do represent a particular point of view or community of interest or whatever. But we have to remember uh, that we also have a port hat. And that port hat, so sometimes you're going to be having your own hat, but sometimes you, I hope you will remember that you carry a port hat. And that's why you're here tonight as a community, as a group, um, to put that on and hopefully with good, healthy dialogue, um, with collaboration, with being able to see other perspectives. And I think that uh, when we see and touch the elephant from all different <coughs> perspectives, we'll have a better view for what that is in the room. And hopefully then you can come to a conclusion. So you may, uh, at times, be influenced by what you hear. And you may change your mind. And that's fine. And I hope we think that's very much. And I think we think that's going to be extremely uh, healthy dialogue going forward. So this is not about you know who's going to be striking to win out against somebody else's point of view. I think it is going to be a collaborative. And I really sincerely hope that, that the process will be collaborative, unifying, uh, and that we come away much stronger in terms of what we see in the long term for this port. And uh, we're really excited at the Commission to have your input. It helps us to uh, to uh, look at it, and uh, we're here to sort of hopefully make some right choices and decisions uh, that affect um, our fellow citizens in the city of San Francisco and the world in the long run. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Commissioner Wu Ho. And so now it is my great privilege to introduce to you the two people we completely hoodwinked and co-opted to serve as the chairs of this august group. And that is uh, Rudy Nothenberg, who is uh, a former and probably current mentor of mine for now too long that I want to tell you, and Janice Lee. And they have agreed to um, uh, work with the, the staff on a regular basis to set the agendas to make sure that we are working towards our goals. As I think most of you know, we did spend a very long period of time taking a look back at what has happened uh, and been accomplished since the Waterfront Land Use Plan was first adopted so that we had a very um, clear starting point. We are just amazed in all that has come together. But in doing so, we also were able to see where there are some gaps. And those are the gaps that we really want to focus on. There's probably a gazillion things we could talk about, but we do have a defined purpose and a defined course of action so that we don't have you here for the rest of your lives. And for that, we have asked uh, Rudy and Janice to lead us. And with that, I'd like to turn the meeting officially over to them and give them my heartfelt gratitude in taking on this role. So thank you all very much. And again, thank you so much for being here tonight and all of your participation. Well, thank you, Monique, and uh, thank you all for coming. My name, as Monique said, is Reed Nothenberg, and to my right is Janice Lee, who is my co-chair, who is the co-chair, I should say. Uh, I'll be running these, managing these meetings, but in all other, uh, all other respects of this process, Janice and I will be co-equal partners, so the fact that I'm running the meeting does not infer that there's any difference between us in terms of the way in which this, the outcome of this will be managed. Uh, I think it is probably fair to say, speaking for both of us, that we do not have a specific uh, 
agenda in mind. We don't have a specific end product that we're seeking. We're here to manage a process, and that the end product will come from you as a result of a deliberate but uh, fully participative process. And in order to manage that process well, it, uh, one could come up with a rigid set of rules about how we're going to proceed in these meetings. I really don't want to do that. First of all, rules are inherently confrontational, and this is not a confrontational situation. They're going to be broken in any event, so I'm trying to try to get away from having a really rigid set of rules. We will depend upon your good sense and, I must say, on your good manners in order to accommodate the diverse number of people here and to give everybody a chance to participate and participate fully. Uh, the only rule that, the only two rules that I would ask you to adhere to would be A, to be concise. Be as concise as possible because we all want to get this over with in as efficient a matter, manner as possible. And the other thing is perhaps a bit more constraining but I would ask you, please, as you begin to confer and as you begin to address uh, the experts and ourselves, do so through the chair. Please wait to be recognized before you speak. Otherwise, it's going to be absolutely impossible to manage a group of 30 people. It's the only way we, we can assure equity so that everybody has a chance to talk, that nobody monopolizes the conversation. So do yourselves and do us the favor, do Janice and I the favor of asking for recognition before you speak. Other than that, if we need a lot of rules, we'll make them as we go along. But let's just try not to begin with a set of 25 bylaws and God knows what. Let's just go to work and do so with sense and sensitivity. And uh, Janice, if you want to add to that, please do. I don't think that's necessary, uh, but <laughs> since I am a newer face in the room, I'll at least give a brief introduction to who I am. I think Rudy is a historic figure in San Francisco, so does not need the same introduction. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my name is Janice Lee. You may know me wearing oftentimes my San Francisco Bicycle Coalition hat. Know that I have put that hat mostly aside in my role here, um, except in you know assisting and outreach and getting the word out about this wonderful process that we have ahead of us. Um, I really see my role here as you know, managing this process and making sure it's the best it can possibly be, assisting everyone here, um, assisting the public at large, and certainly the port as we go through this waterfront land use plan uh, update. Um, based on all the work that's already been done. And generally I'm here as a waterfront enthusiast and also a West Side resident of what I like to call the Western Waterfront, also known as Ocean Beach. So um, hope that we can have a great meeting to kick this all off. Thank you. Uh, the next few minutes we're going to take to try to introduce ourselves to each other, again with concision, if you please. What I'd like to do is ask different sides of the room, one here, one there, one there, to just each say a brief word about who you are, what you bring to the meeting, and do so quickly as you can. Let's start with the gentleman at the end there, and then we'll switch over to the other side. I can't read your name place from this far, so otherwise, uh, I, otherwise I call in you by name. Okay. My name is Peter Somerville. Um, yeah, very briefly, a San Francisco resident, San Francisco native. Um, like Miss Lee, I live on the western side of town, closer to Kelly's Cove. So I guess between the Sunset and the Richmond, we have <laughs> that part of the city covered. Uh, my day job, I work for the Treasure Island Authority, and um, just happy to be part of the process. Thank you. Over there, can't see. Okay. Hi, my name is Christopher Christensen. Uh, like uh, Peter here, I'm a San Francisco native. Uh, I live in District 3, and uh, I am uh, with the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, Local 10, uh, Dispatcher, Executive Board, NCDC, and uh, Balma President, our association. So I just want to help preserve the waterfront and keep it as beautiful as it always been. Thank you. Mr. Highland? Yes, I'm Aaron Highland. I'm uh, an architect that spent my career in historic uh, properties. I'm representing the Historic Preservation Commission on the working group. And uh, I'm also, tangentially, uh, will be the 2016 president of the American Institute of Architects San Francisco chapter. Very well. The gentleman over there. I'm uh, 
Sorry, I'm Jasper Rubin. I'm a former, former city planner. I manage the Central Waterfront Neighborhood Plan. Uh, I left the city to take up a position at San Francisco State University, where I'm currently a chair of the <coughs> Urban Studies and Planning Program. And if you're really having a hard time sleeping at night, you can read my book on the transformation of San Francisco's waterfront uh, <laughs> since 1950. It's been highly recommended to me, so if you can get it, it's online, I believe, and maybe you can find out from Mr. Island where it is. Corinne? Uh, my name is Corinne Woods. Uh, I'm here representing the Port Central Waterfront Advisory Group, which I co-chair with Toby Levine. Um, I am a 30-year port tenant. Uh, I've worked on the Blue Greenway project. I've worked on other open space projects at the port. Uh, and uh, I'm also a member of the Bayview Boat Club. Okay. Next, please. Hello, I'm John Gollinger. I'm an environmental attorney, and I headed up the No Wall on the Waterfront campaign, which many of you are familiar with. Um, I've been in the city for 15 years. I live here in North Beach, and I uh, look forward to working with many of you to keep our waterfront beautiful. Thank you. Alice? Hello, I'm Alice Rogers, um, and I'm here uh, basically channeling the South Beach, Rincon, Mission Bay, apart from, Cor I mean, along with Corinne um, area at, and Central Soma. I started getting steeped in waterfront issues um, for decades when I lived in Sausalito, um, and I've just continued my interest um, and involvement in waterfront issues for the last 20 years here. Thank you. Ms. Richardson? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Linda Fadiki Richardson. I am a long-time uh, India Basin uh, resident in the Bayview Hunters Point, uh, currently director of uh, San Francisco Treasure Island. I have served on BCDC, San Francisco Planning Commission, and a host of other uh, commissions uh, in the city. I am a land use expert, also bring a lot of um, environmental, environmental justice uh, expertise. I'm glad to be part of this wonderful uh, folks, a group of people. And we're glad to have you, Ms. Horgan. So I'm Carolyn Horgan. I work for the Blue and Gold Fleet, Fisherman's Wharf, and I've actually worked at Fisherman's Wharf since 1973. Um, I've seen changes, since a lot of changes, as most of you have, along the waterfront, and I think it's wonderful what's happened, and I just want to be a part of how it continues to be um, such, such a beautiful place to work. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Rudolovich? Yeah, I'm Tom Rudolovich. I'm executive director of Livable City, a nonprofit organization here in the city that uh, uh, works with the Port on Sunday Streets events, um, uh, among other things. Uh, I have, uh, I'm also an elected member of the BART Board of Directors and uh, have been on uh, what feels like innumerable uh, committees uh, related to the waterfront over the years. Thank you. And Stuart? I'm Stuart Morton. I'm representing NEWAG, the Northeast Waterfront Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, I live on Telegraph Hill. My office is in Dogpatch, my office and warehouse. I've been on committees for the port since the 80s when I was transportation chair of the Fishman's Wharf. Been on the beginning of the uh, of New Ag um, and look forward to this. Thank you. Mr. Kelton. My, my name is Ken Kelton. I'm a San Francisco native building contractor. Uh, worked in the past on transit issues with the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition. Uh, here at the behest of the Bay Area Sea Kayakers and a number of yachties. I have a sailboat and a kayak, and we're interested in coastal access. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. I'm Karen Pierce. I'm a native San Franciscan and a resident of Baby Hunters Point. I'm co-chair of the Southern Waterfront Advisory Committee, um, and I work for the San Francisco Department of Public Health. Um, and my mother was a Rosie the Riveter, <laughs> um, in the 1940s, so we have a long history of supporting the waterfront activities that are related to maritime activity. Thank you. Okay, Mr. James. Earl James. Uh, I'm here representing my district. I live in Coal Valley. Uh, I'm trained as a geologist, work as an environmental consultant. I've been involved in several projects that involve environmental remediation along the waterfront. Uh, mainly in the East Bay. Ms. Turner? I'm Ann Turner. I grew up on the peninsula, spent a lot of years on the East Coast. I'm a librarian, 
and um, I managed, I came home to California to manage the Santa Cruz City County Public Library System. Um, when my husband died, I decided I had to make a new life for myself and it wasn't gonna be in Santa Cruz. So I moved to the city three and a half years ago and, um, and then I somewhat foolishly uh, volunteered, applied to be a member of the civil grand jury. And I say foolishly because we worked terribly, terribly hard and nobody paid any attention <laughs> uh, to what we recommended. Um, I think this is going to be a lot more fun. And <laughs> I suspect that one reason I got appointed was because I told the story. My dad was an executive for American President Lines and he used to complain bitterly that APL and San Francisco had let the port go to Oakland. Wrong, 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 said he. I, in fact, think that the outcome is quite interesting and good. I like all that stuff over in Oakland, but I like our port the way it is here. Well, thank you and welcome. Okay, Mr. Bennett. Hi, I'm Kirk Bennett. I'm a retired former member of port staff. And Anne, I did read the grand jury report. <laughs> <laughs> and fell asleep, right? <laughs> read the whole thing early in the morning. Um, when I first joined the port, I was with the real estate uh, division and uh, managed the port properties, real estate properties from Ferry Building up to Fisherman's Wharf. After the waterfront plan was approved, then I moved over to the planning and development division, where I was fortunate to be a manager of waterfront development projects. Um, currently, I live in Brentwood, uh, California, which is way at the eastern edge of the Bay Area. So I think my role on the advisor group is to bring a regional uh, <laughs> perspective. You can't get much more regional than Brentwood, um, you know, to, uh, to this planning <laughs> process. Sure. Okay, thank you. We'll stay on the left wing for a while, Ms. Greenberg. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, so I'm Stephanie Greenberg, and I've lived in the city for a couple dozen years, and the majority of that has been on the southern side of Telegraph Hill, so I have a very keen interest in the area. Um, I've been very involved um, civically and with different community advocacy efforts citywide and district-wide. Um, locally, I am part of the Northeast Waterfront Advisory Group. I also serve as board president for the Top of Broadway Community Benefit District and also Sotel Neighbors, which is a local neighborhood organization. And I'm very honored to be part of this group and very much look forward to working with everyone. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Workman. Hi, everybody. I'm Dee Dee Workman. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy for the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I've been working with the Chamber of Commerce for a few years, but I know a lot of you in this room because um, in the mid-'90s, or so, I was the, became the executive director of San Francisco Beautiful, and uh, I was in that position for almost 12 years. Uh, and that's how I got to know many of you um, and uh, folks at the port. We did a lot of work uh, on community improvement projects along the waterfront. Uh, and I'm really happy to be you know, back working on these issues uh, via the chamber. And we're glad to have you, Ms. Rupke. Hi, I'm Christina. Um, I live in uh, Mission Bay, so I'm over with you guys. Um, I work over here in the financial district as a lawyer um, at Charts is Brees, and so I commute via the waterfront, and then I'm an avid sailor in my spare time. I'm currently Commodore of the Bay Area Association of Disabled Sailors, and so I care a lot about access to the water from an accessibility standpoint as well as a recreational boater's perspective. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we'll go over back over there. I can't. Ms. Ballard? Hi, I'm Grant Ballard. I'm uh, Chief Science Officer at Point Blue Conservation Science, which is a nonprofit that was founded as Point Reyes Bird Observatory in 1965. Um, so I'm an ecologist studying climate change impacts on ecosystems and human communities. Um, I was on the Baylands Ecosystem Habitats Goals Update Steering Committee, and I'm also a um, uh, project leader for the Our Coast, Our Future project, which is uh, studying sea level rise impacts on San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Mr. Carroll? Uh, my name is Kevin Carroll. I'm currently the executive director of the Hotel Council of San Francisco. I <coughs> have lived in San Francisco for 45 years. I'm not a native, but I have lived here and I played on Fisherman's Wharf as a child. So I have a lot of memories of San Francisco. Um, I currently uh, I work with the Hotel Council, so I'm representing the tourism industry. 
But prior to that, I ran the Fisherman's Wharf Community Benefit District, and that's where I worked closely with the port and a lot of the programs that are going on. And I also serve on the SF Travel Board of Directors so I can help bring the work here also out to the travel industry as well. And I currently chair the Workforce Investment Board for San Francisco. And so I'm keenly aware of jobs and wanting to make sure of the workforce side of it as well. And I'm honored to be part of this working group. Very good, thank you. Mr. Congdon. My name is Jeffrey Congdon. I moved to San Francisco in 1966. Uh, live out by the Presidio. Uh, I've been in the real estate industry for over 40 years, so my background is finance and real estate. I've actually handled a number of transactions of buildings that are not on the water, <laughs> but across the street from the water, so it's always been an interest of mine as to what might happen here. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bueller. Um, hi, I'm Mike Bueller. I'm executive director of San Francisco Heritage. We're a citywide historic preservation organization. I'm also a former member of the Central Waterfront Advisory Group. And uh, our organization previously collaborated with the port on the Embarcadero National Register Historic District and uh, published Port City, uh, many of the contents of the district in, in that publication. Thank you. Thank you. That'll be a good segue to Ellen. My name is Ellen Jonk and I'm co-chair of the Ports Maritime Commerce Advisory Committee and representing that group on this body. I'm also a mayoral appointee to the San Francisco Historic Preservation Commission. I've served on the California Coastal Commission for many years and was chairman for the North Region. I have my own business as an environmental consultant, archaeologist uh, here for Bay and Coastal Projects. Thank you. Uh, Ron? I'm Ron Miguel. I'm a fourth, <coughs> excuse me, third generation San Franciscan. I've lived in Petrero Hill for about 40 years and am very active in Petrero Hill and Dog Patch. I've been involved in land use issues for, well, at least since the early 70s, and I'm a past president of the Planning Commission. Thank you. And Mr. Trevetti? Uh, hello, I'm uh, Dilip Trevetti. I am a coastal engineer. <clears throat> with Moffat and Nickel, a consulting firm in the East Bay. Have been fortunate to work on many of the port redevelopment projects that are ongoing, um, primarily dealing with issues related to coastal flooding, uh, sea level rise, and uh, seismic stability of the shoreline. Thank you very much. And um, we have been promised by the staff that we will get a directory of all of the members of the working group along with their association and email numbers to the, ex to the extent that you're willing to pass them out and telephone numbers so we'll have a better idea of who we are and can communicate a little better, bit better. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the next item on the agenda, and to show you how well organized we are, I'm not quite sure now what that's supposed to be, but it's the Working Group Responsibilities Organization meeting times. Is that, uh, is there a staff presentation you want to make with this, or is this up to us? Up to us. Well, thank you. In that case, we'll make short, short work of it. Uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, you have all been sent a longish paper that staff wrote with respect to the responsibilities of the working group and the proposed meeting times and uh, dates and the sequence of issues that we will consider. Uh, I think that the sequence of issues we will consider is at this moment an inventory. I don't know that we will be able to hew exactly to that uh, to those blocks of time and those sequences, but we will try. And those issues are responsive to the issues and to the matters that both Monique and Commissioner Ho mentioned, in that there are a number of unresolved issues left over or that have emerged since the publication of the original waterfront uh, land use plan. And our task collectively is to try to come up with some answers to the questions that are asked and that are unresolved because either they were not on the front burner at the time the original document was uh, adopted, such as the sea level rise and the, condition, the seismic condition of the seawall, and the other issues relate to changes in circumstances, which are natural after the years that the original plan has been in existence. And we will need to consider what 
updates and what changes we will need to make to the plan that are related to the changes in external conditions which have occurred since that plan was adopted. So we have a, a large agenda, but it does, is not unlimited. It is limited to those questions which the port and the commission wants us to respond to. <coughs> and what we will try to do, or what I hope we will be able to do, is to have staff presentations on each of these issues followed then by commentary and comments and questions from the members of the working group, assisted by such members of the advisory committee that have expertise on these items. Once the working group has had its say, we will turn it over to the public so the public can have its say, and then we will move on to the next item on the agenda. We'll do that agenda item by agenda item. The dates for the meetings are in your packet and uh, if there are any real problems for any of you with respect to those dates, I think it would be best if you communicated those to staff. And we will try to have a staff person appointed who will be the focal point or the focus for all of your questions and uh, issues respecting attendance and so forth. I don't know, know who that will be yet, but we will have that name for you uh, eventually. Um, other than that, I think the, the practicalities of how we proceed are fairly uh, apparent, and will, they will necessarily evolve as we go along. And uh, if there are any questions uh, to Janice or I, I doubt that either one of them can answer them, but I suspect the staff can. So perhaps we will limit the questions now to members of working group, and once they have had their questions answered, if they're answerable, then we'll have the uh, questions come from the public. So if there's any member of the working group that has a question or a comment, uh, please be at, have at it, and I will ask uh, staff to be aware and listening and be prepared to respond. Uh, Corinne? Um, you have dates by <coughs> month, but is there a fixed date each month that you have, are thinking about having these meetings on? Trying to figure out how they fit in with about 25 other meetings that happen I, every I, month? I think there's specific dates in, in the package. I'm not finding them. I'm not finding it. Oh, they're not out to it? Yeah. It was, yeah, it was, it was an email. It was an email. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Once again, my name is Ann Cook. I'm part of the Waterfront oh. Land Use Plan team here at the port. There were meeting dates that should have been with your cover memo, but I will make sure that you all get the meeting dates. In general, well, actually, they are all Wednesday evenings from 6 to 8. They are usually the second Wednesday with a few exceptions. Um, there's usually once a month and there's a couple months where there are two. And I can probably even get you the dates while we're in this meeting um, so that you have them handy. Okay. And if there's anybody else who does not have the memo with those dates, we will get them. We will get them to you. And, and I can read them for the record if you like. No, I don't think okay. that's necessary. Right. Thank you. So Other thank you. I'll get them for you, Corinne. Yes, please. Ms. Pierce. Um, so looking at the, the uh, port-wide issues list, mm -hmm. I am wondering, I'm, I understand that at this point it makes, the sequence makes sense, mm -hmm. um, but I've worked on these kinds of committees before and often we get to a point where we realize that um, we need to have more information on something else that's later down on the list. Is there room for moving those um, um, subjects around if it turns out that we feel that we need to have more information on one thing before we discuss the other? Well, speaking, I think for us collectively, I think there has to be room to move them around. And I think the staff will have to be flexible as well. It is, it is, there's an overlay on three or four of those having to do with the finances and the capital plan. And we will need to get that, I think, before us earlier than it's, it's scheduled. So I think, yes, as we, as we begin to move through, it'll become obvious that the sequence isn't quite right and, and, and we'll have to change it. And you guys are going to have to be flexible to do that. Thank you. Uh, other questions, comments? Yes, Ron. Yeah. 
I had another comment just about um, the nature of what we're doing and maybe a touchstone I wanted to suggest. The, I think many, if not most folks, know that the waterfront plan was a requirement uh, of a voter passed ordinance in 1990, Prop H, um, that required the port to create a waterfront plan and uh, some folks were here were involved in that process. Um, one thing that we don't have in our materials is the actual ordinance that voters approved, which is chapter 61 of the administrative code. It's in the uh, original waterfront plan, so if you have that, it's in there, but I wondered if that could be provided to everyone here because the specific, my understanding is what we're doing is fulfilling what the voters said, which is that the waterfront land use plan shall be reviewed by the agency which prepared it at, uh, at a minimum of every five years with a view toward making any necessary amendments consistent with this initiative. And uh, sort of the chair, I think, broadly stated that, but in my understanding, this means we should refer back to the initiative because the voters did say things along the lines of maritime should be a priority, hotels should not be allowed on the waterfront, et cetera, and obviously we could propose changes, but um, I think we should, I would propose we stick with that as our framework, and if we wanna propose revising it, we can do that. Is that I, I, I think, valuable? I, I think it is obvious that, and I appreciate you calling us our attention, all that we do has to be based on the ordinance as it, as it was adopted and it has been amended. Uh, as a tool, to getting us there, there is the uh, revision, the draft revision that has been provided, a chance to read it. Um, but that to the the ordinance and the rev and the amendments to it and what has occurred since provide the four corners of what we're going to be looking at. And if you don't have a copy of the ordinance, or if it it, it should be available, I assume it's available online and perhaps in a summary of this meeting that goes out, you might uh, give us a link to it or give everybody a link to it. Brad is nodding so that people can see the ordinance. And uh, clearly we are within the four corners of that ordinance and I appreciate you calling it to our attention. Yes, Ms. Richardson. Yes, sir, and I agree with John, but I also feel that we need to look. A lot of the issues that were raised in the original plan, uh, time, events and realities also have taken over and we need to look at the future of the port. Uh, given the fact that we're dealing with sea level rise, we have dilapidated infrastructures, which even then they were only mentioning, I read uh, you know, the plan in total. So I'm thinking that part of the work that we're also required to do here is to look at how will the city, this uh, port, be able to sustain itself within the next 20 or 30 years yes, uh, moving I, I, forward and what are the capital improvement that are not based on revenue now because we have shortfalls because of the uh, dilapidated infrastructure, what are we going to propose to make sure that this not only remain a first class waterfront um, in the US and but also one that is going to be able to hold up to what it originally was intended to be. So. Yes, I, I, I think that I, I agree. I think we all agree with that. I think what Mr. Goldman was suggesting is that we, we cannot go in contravention of the ordinance. It doesn't mean that we can add, that we cannot look at new issues that were, that, that are consistent with the with the intent of the ordinance. I, I think that's. I think we would be terribly constrained if we were not able to do that. But we cannot contravene the ordinance as it still exists. Thank you. Yes. I'm wondering what, uh, if any thought has been given to kind of what the deliverables are, you know, so what, what is this process going to produce? Is it simply a, an updated version of uh, the prior plan or um, as we move forward with this, can we realize, well, there, there are certain issues that I've observed over the years that, you know, kind of get projects in trouble all the time that are unresolved issues, you know, issues around a transportation plan, yeah, how to manage parking. Could, is it possible that we'll be able to, to dig in, um, provide some, kind of additional depth um, or additional planning uh, around certain issues, or is it just um, we're, we're, we're gonna redo the old plan? Uh, I mean, my, a flip answer that I could give you at the moment is we'll see, but I think okay. that may be there may be a better answer, and I'm gonna ask staff to respond to that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Diane Oshima with the port staff. Actually, um, 
I could try and answer that now, but some of it might be answered in the waterfront plan overview item on your agenda. And so perhaps if you wanted to save the question, if I didn't really address it well, that might be the most efficient way to do it. Okay, thank you. If that's okay with you, Tom. Yeah, that's fine. Thank okay. you. Other questions? Okay. Will there be an opportunity to submit written comments as well as our sort of uh, verbal comments we might make at meetings? I, I would hope so, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think if anyone has, if anybody, advisory committee, members of the working group, have a issue they want to discuss in more detail and more broadly than they can concisely do in a few minutes, I think a paper in writing that would be circulated to all of us and the staff would be a very good way to do so. And that's one of the reasons we need to get a list of how we all contact each other. It's, a, it's an excellent idea and I hope, I hope those of you who are knowledgeable and verbose will use the paper. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, anybody else? Yeah, let me ask the gentleman over there. Go ahead. Uh, it's just a comment. As far as the boilerplate goes, I'd encourage that we add language regarding limited English proficiency speakers, uh, availability of materials or translations for those, uh, if nothing else, to assist in our ongoing outreach to all members of the community. I, uh, th that's something staff is, staff's got to be aware of that, but, hmm? yes. okay, thank you. Corinne? Um, one committee I was on recently, uh, decided to blind copy instead of put everybody's name out there. I, it, it seemed to be awkward if we didn't all have each other's information and we couldn't communicate, but I think that is something that we need to find out early, whether people are willing to share their email addresses with the yes. whole group or whether they would prefer their information to be kept confidential? Yes. I, because I, otherwise we're kind of constrained. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. Now, when I suggested to staff that we do that, I suggest that we ask people whether they'd be willing to be listed and whether they'd be willing to provide information. If they're not, that's fine too. Thank you. I, I think that's right. Some people may not want the email addresses floating around or their phone numbers, yeah. And, and that's gonna be up to each of you to judge. Yeah, Ron? Uh, yeah, not, not to put a damper on intercommunication, um, but the reply all button uh, <laughs> goes uh, in contravention uh, to the Brown Act for this well, group, and I think we have to be very no. conscious of that. Well, for, uh, excuse me, for, very, for, you know, having lived with Brown Act for I, most of my of life, as, as Ron has, <laughs> um, we are fortunately not covered by it. We're not we're an not. official body, no. Even though we're, we're, no, we're report. We are not an official body, and That's we are not subject to Brown Act. <laughs> uh, Thank however, you. let me, let, you know, it's a good thing you brought that up. Yeah. My intention, and I hope you'll be support. In this, is to be as close to the Brown Act as we can be without subjecting ourselves to the worst of the strictures that it imposes. <laughs> the Brown Act has a purpose, it has a reason, and to the extent we can live within the, 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 the public knowledge aspects of that without tying ourselves in knots, I hope that we can be there. But I don't want to get ourselves tied up in knots because of all of the craziness of the of the uh, that's accreted to the Brown Act over the years. So thank you for that Pretty point. Thank you. Yes, sorry. Um, and actually, could any of the staff actually discuss what I think is already listed in this document, but all of the noticing and all the minutes that will be shared? Is there in the which would normally be needed of a Brown Act body, but even though we are not a Brown Act body, that the same minutes, the same agendas will be shared in advance. And can you speak to that, please? So, yes, the, the short answer is yes. Um, in the procedures, we have indicated that we will be trying to save, send a save the date notice about two weeks in advance of the meeting. The draft agenda goes out a week in advance of the meeting. Uh, meeting summaries are uh, going to be produced for every working group meeting. All of the information is on the website. And at least for the time being, we thought that it would be good to do the SFGov 
taping, so I will say at the moment, if anybody has a problem with being on videoed, um, you can contact us and we'll try and make sure that you stay out of the eye, but um, I think that it's a great way of memorializing this process. Thank you. Yes, can I make Kiss? just one request, notwithstanding the Brown Act, but I would like to request the judicious use of reply all. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Self-discipline is a wonderful thing. Yes. <laughs> Rare and wonderful. <laughs> yeah. uh, anybody else? Okay, yes, I think Mr. we... I'm sorry, uh, Ellen? Uh, one last thing, building on the comment about the foundation, the origin of, of the plan. Um, I was very interested in reading the goals, and I have some thoughts about how the goals might be altered. Should those ideas be brought up during the different segments or is, is, that, um, is there an opportunity to uh, well, There's probably an opportunity, but it may be that that's, if, if that is a thoughtful piece, it would be nice to have that circulated, put in writing. Okay. Okay, Fine. circulated Thanks. through the Good. staff. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we are within about five minutes of our schedule, which on the whole ain't bad. Uh, we will move on if we can to item number four. And that's the staff. And does that require a presentation back here? Yes. So right. there is a little logistical shifting. Yeah, I think we need to get out of here. Were you to take a comment on that? We will have oh, a yeah, you know, just um, crawl under. Oh, let me, let me, I'm sorry. I'm reminded by my co-chair that perhaps we ought to give the public a shot at comment before we uh, go on to item number four. Brief, concise. Is there any comment question from those of you who are sitting not at the table? Yes, in the back. Would you use the mic? Would you use the mic, please? Hi. So I'm hoping that relative to what was said before in terms of um, honoring the, uh, the, uh, the plan that came before and with the process now that, I don't know, I'm not sure if it should be purely regarded as an additive process and that, you know, maybe you should, I, I don't, I'm not sure what's, uh, be open to the fact that some things actually need to be neg negated from the previous plan. Are you BCBC or John? I'm sorry. Tobias. Thank you. Okay. Can you we me? also have an introduction for John? Okay. We have just been joined by Mr. Tobias. Would you give us a very brief summary of who you are and why you're here? Uh, sure. Uh, so, John Tobias, I'm uh, the 30, 30 plus year um, living in San Francisco, a resident of San Francisco. Um, been living in uh, Bayview Hunters Point for the last uh, 15 years or so. And uh, you know, I've uh, I remember the port, the waterfront when it you know the highway was up and all of that sort of thing, and I've seen the changes in the last uh, you know 20 years or so, and it's been been fantastic. So when this opportunity came up, I was just very interested in. Well, you're most welcome, and just to bring up to date, we had item number four on the agenda. Unless there is other questions out there, yes, please use the mic, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm Bob Myers, and uh, there was a plan before the earlier plan, and um, I'm a relic from that time. There was a waterfront plan in 1977 that was required by BCDC that had a citizens' advisory committee. We met in the ferry building. We had a joint staff with redevelopment and um, the port and city planning. I was one of the city planning staff. And we had representation from, <coughs> excuse me, neighborhood organizations, uh, similar to what we have now. Um, the requirement was to provide sub areas, which we have, I see in the new uh, proposal, we have our four sub areas. But maintaining maritime activity was a main uh, goal of the plan. We had significant representation from the unions, uh, which were much more active on the port then. So I didn't bring a copy of the plan with me. I'm glad to see that the, uh, uh, 
review of the 1977 plan is in a similar horizontal format that we did in 1977. The, the 97 was, was a takeoff on the 77. I'll be glad to bring in a copy next time just to cool. show you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other comment, questions out there? Anybody? Okay, hearing none, we will move on to item number four, which requires uh, technology, and we have to get out of the way. Thank you, everyone. Um, again, my name is Diane Oshima, and uh, we have a, a really wonderful port staff team. Uh, maybe if I could just quickly introduce their names so that they won't sound unfamiliar to you. Uh, Ann Cook was standing up earlier to answer a question. Uh, she's standing up there, right, waving her hand. Uh, Carrie Kilstrom, also right here. Uh, the three of us actually worked on the last waterfront plan, so we're going to have to sort of dust off our memory banks. We're joined by uh, David Beaupre, Brad Benson, Byron Rett, and you will see over the course of this process a number of other port staff as well as members of other city agencies that we work with. So um, we thank you very much for coming. Um, this presentation is going to provide a high-level overview of the Waterfront Land Use Plan. So some of this I will have to be taking on in more summary form, but my objective here is to be able to give everybody sort of a, an overall understanding about what the framework is as set forth in the Waterfront Plan, leading to the policy issues that we are asking the working group to take a look at. Um, many of you may have been in a number of presentations that we've had previously, so we're not trying to repeat too much of the past and focusing on what we're uh, really tasked to do at this point. Um, with respect to the waterfront plan itself, uh, as John was indicating, that there was a voter mandate uh, approved by the voters in 1990, Proposition H, which did call for somebody, the port, it could have been other agencies as well, to develop a waterfront land use plan for port piers and properties that were in BCDC's jurisdiction. So uh, not all port property was called for in the waterfront plan. Um, Prop H, and by the way, the ordinance that John was referring to is in as an appendix in the waterfront plan. The waterfront plan is online and available to the public, and uh, we're happy to provide copies of the ordinance to the working group and public at a future meeting if you want. Um, but with respect to um, the Prop H requirements itself, uh, it's actually, this process is somewhat of an echo of what we heard from the voters back then, and that was to make sure that we had a, a public planning process with maximum public participation. Uh, the Prop H, while it required a land use plan to be developed, it also imposed a prohibition of hotels on piers because of concerns at the time about uh, too many hotel proposals that were being proposed. Um, and until the waterfront plan was completed, there was a moratorium that was placed on non-maritime development on port properties so that the plan could inform that. And perhaps the most important uh, priority that was stated was for maritime industries to really have first dibs on the port's properties. Um, so we will be talking about it that a little bit. Um, so we created a waterfront plan advisory board. So it's very similar to this working group. Uh, the, the appointment process is a little bit different, but the idea was the same, is to really get a citywide voice as to what this waterfront land use plan should look like. And um, the Port Commission really had a choice of actually uh, delegating the authority for the waterfront plan to the planning department or another agency, but chose to do it itself, and also chose to include all of the port's property in the plan, not just those which within the BCDC's jurisdiction. So that Waterfront Plan Advisory Board, which was chaired by Bob Tufts, who was the chair of BCDC at the time, worked for four years, developed a draft recommended plan for the Waterfront Land Use Plan to the Port Commission. The Port Commission basically took it without making any amendments except for one, which was to call out the need for some sort of urban design policy framework so that not only would we know what kinds of uses and activities we wanted to promote for different areas of the port, we wanted to have a sense of what that would look like and what that would feel like from a design 
open space and preservation perspective. And so they required that a waterfront design and access element be added and incorporated into the waterfront land use plan. And, and that is uh, then what the port and the planning department working with us did. Uh, by 1997, we had everything put together, the EIR was done, and the Port Commission was able to approve that. And thereafter, between 1998 and 2000, we went back to the Planning Commission, the Board of Supervisors, and the BCDC Commission to make amendments in the city's general plan and BCDC's plans so that port, city, and BCDC policies, not for every single property, for, but for a goodly portion uh, in terms of BCDC's policies were aligned with uh, port policies, which were aligned with the city's policies. There are still some areas of the port that um, we did not cover in the BCDC amendments, and, and so uh, we have been working with them since then. There we go. So the framework, um, the goals of the Waterfront Land Use Plan, the vision at the time was um, actually, it's, it's, it's Pretty amazing to have Rudy uh, be the co-chair of this group because at the time that that waterfront plan process started, the Embarcadero transportation projects were just being implemented. And so there was this huge transportation investment by the city. And the question was, now that the city had a transportation system in place, what would the port do to improve its piers? And so that was sort of the challenge for the waterfront land use plan. And the idea there was, reuniting San Francisco with its waterfront in the aftermath of the Loma Prieta earthquake and the takedown of the Embarcadero Freeway. So in that context, um, this is a summary of the, the framing goals of the waterfront plan, a working port to really emphasize the priority of the many different maritime industries that exist along the port, many of which you may not be aware, but we will be talking about in this process a revitalized waterfront, something that is alive, that's open to the public, it creates a reason for people to come out to the water's edge with offerings of a diversity of different activities and opportunities and land uses that are appropriate for an urban waterfront, which is a mishmash of a lot of different things. There was a lot of sentiment and consensus about providing for that kind of a broad diversity of activities. And clearly, public open space and parks and creating clean, environmentally uh, beautiful places for people to just come and come out to the waterfront and enjoy and appreciate San Francisco Bay had to be kind of a, a sinew that ran through that entire program. And then, uh, as relates to the waterfront design and access element, urban design that recognized the iconic finger pier profile that the ports properties give to the city at large um, that also made room for being able to accommodate changes and new development that address some of the financial requirements for waterfront improvement. So the first priority again, maritime uses. I am not going to go through the 10 different maritime industries that exist at the port. We have a, a meeting that is scheduled in February dedicated to that specific purpose. But uh, the main point that you should know is that there was probably six months spent just doing a profile of every single maritime industry, what the operations involve, what kind of land and financing requirements are required, how that relates with labor and workforce. And so that was all previewed with the Waterfront Plan Advisory Board that set uh, some priority policies for advancing maritime ahead of other uh, public benefits. Again, um, the diversity of uses, that's what we heard from everybody, um, that this was such a treasure and people wanted to be able to enjoy it in many different ways. We did talk a lot about the regulatory environment, the policies and the rules and the laws that apply to port property. The next meeting that we have of this working group is scheduled in January and that will be on port governance. So broadly speaking, most of the port's properties are formerly owned by the state that were transferred to the city and county of San Francisco in 1969. And with that legislative shift, that transfer of state properties, comes a number of state uh, principles, public trust principles that flow with the land that the Port Commission is responsible for upholding. Many of those public trust uh, 
principles deny uh, some of the uses that are most common in an urban context, like housing or office. And so uh, the Waterfront Plan Advisory Board was uh, briefed on this, but nevertheless really advanced a full palette of land uses and ex ex acceptable land uses on port property, even knowing what those regulatory constraints were on the theory that if there was consensus around thoughtfully integrating a mix of these uses, that then there would be the basis for proposals for regulatory interpretations or changes that would allow that to be so. This is particularly true for the seawall lots, the parking lots, many of our parking lots on the other side of the Embarcadero or Upland. Those sites are really remnants of other neighborhoods that have previously been industrial areas that turned into mixed-use neighborhoods, and the port's parcels are the remnants of that. So the, the waterfront plan recognized that larger city fabric, and that's one of the reasons why there was such embrace of the urban waterfront idea. <coughs> These images are just trying to give you a sense of how diverse the Port of San Francisco is. If you're not familiar with the southern waterfront, uh, we advise you to go down because it's, much, it's so easy to get down there where we have a number of new parks, public access with the Bayview Rise, uh, shipbuilding at Pier 70, and then the Bayview Gateway is the park that we just opened a couple of months ago. So one of the things that Proposition H required was that the Waterfront Land Use Plan identify acceptable uses for port properties. And so uh, if you go to the Waterfront Land Use Plan, you will find charts like this. You can't read it, but there are five of these charts that inventory uh, the port's properties uh, on the, I can't, there we go. Right there, we kind of do a uh, identification of each port property and the range, the menus of acceptable uses and where they are acceptable on which properties. So you'll see that inventoried for every port property in the waterfront plan. These were to really give guidance for the long-term development and improvement and investments of port properties um, versus other policies in the Waterfront Land Use Plan that speak to interim uses of the port's lands. Uh, we've got over 800 acres of properties, and many of these are leased on a shorter term basis, generally zero to 10 years, zero month to month to 10 years, um, for light industrial, kind of run of the mill, work a day uh, businesses. We have over 500 leases on port property with large, small, local, nonprofit community organizations. And because the port's property has so much industrial shed space, it's really very flexible space to accommodate a lot of different kinds of businesses here in San Francisco. Um, so the there is zoning that is in place for port property, and so the interim uses, as long as they're consistent with the zoning, there's a lot more flexibility because the leasing of these port properties is the essential revenue source for most of the port's capital improvements. It's the, it's the source that the port commission controls by maintaining leases and making sure that we get fair market value to generate revenue so that we can repair the port to make uh, improvements. Um, and at, there will be a segment in this uh, process that talks specifically about the port finances and capital planning where we will get into that in more detail. The one exception to that is down in the southern waterfront where we have a lot of raw land still. And so the Waterfront Plan Advisory Board recognized that for interim leasing down in the southern waterfront where it's unimproved, you're probably going to have to invest more to make improvements, to make them viable, even for interim uh, interim businesses and that we should be offering longer terms for those uses to amortize the investments. So we allow for up to 30 years. Again, the waterfront design and access element, it's the pretty picture section of the waterfront land use plan versus the very text heavy verbose waterfront land use plan portion of the plan. Um, but as you will see, it really sets out the framework the policies, the principles that direct us to have a connected public access and open space network. One that provides parks, public access, different forms and types, and really highlights where you got those key 
public view opportunities. Um, those, we talk about the, um, the port's hist maritime historic resources, and we have a number of working group members who will really more expert that, at it than I am, but uh, we call out the need for preserving and rehabilitating those to the extent possible. I mean, at the time, the Waterfront Plan Advisory Board was well aware of the financing you know, challenges that the port faced and the aging condition of the ports back then. City pattern and urban design. This was a kind of a recognition of the port being an entity, but its bigger value was how was it going to knit back into the city and how was it going to be as seamless as possible that, so that people have that whole city, whole regional experience. One of the public trust responsibilities that the port has is not only to improve this waterfront for locals, but to also benefit the residents of the state of California as well. So we have to be looking broadly at making sure that we provide a broad platform for public enjoyment, entertainment, and enterprise. Um, the design and access element also has our architectural design criteria. There's a site-by-site -site, uh, guidance uh, on architectural design criteria. And um, the review of major development projects at the port go back to look at what these uh, policies and design criteria from the design and access element are uh, by a review of the Waterfront Design Advisory Committee. When the Waterfront Plan was adopted, we wanted to integrate a city and port uh, integrated review of port development projects so that the design was responsive not only to the particulars of the port, but to the broader urban design element and some of the design policies and objectives of the city at large. So those of you who follow waterfront development projects, you're probably aware of the Waterfront Design and Advisory Committee. They meet on an as-needed basis for major development projects and where it falls within uh, BCDC jurisdiction, we usually have it as a joint meeting between BCDC's Design Review Board and the city's Waterfront Design Advisory Committee. With respect to the policies and the principles for developing a, an integrated open space and public access network, um, the design and access element, the waterfront land use plan policies promote uh, an interconnected network, recognizing that it will happen incrementally over time. As each project comes along, it should be adding into something that makes the whole better. Um, the Embarcadero Promenade has really been the spine that has held it together for the northern half of the waterfront. Those of you who have been working with the port in the city in the southern portion of the waterfront, south of the ballpark, are going to be familiar with the Blue Greenway Open Space Network, which is a different type of open space network, but the principle is the same, is to have regular located major parks, public access, connections that that reach back into the city. And so the design and access element really tries to promote that kind of a network that picks up from the different characteristics of each of the different neighborhoods and segments of the city that it crosses. Um, we are also um, really looking at open space and public access from the standpoint of water recreation and access from the water, as well as access from land. Uh, and so there are a number of places where the open space and the maritime recreation uses coalesce. We will talk about that more as well in a future meeting. Um, and particularly for the southern waterfront, but also for the northern waterfront, the compatibility with that fundamental maritime industry. There are certain maritime functions, and now with homeland security, federal safety and security requirements, certain things where public access and maritime uses don't really coexist well. And so we need to manage an open space system that recognizes and works with that, looks for the new opportunities for uh, bridging those public benefit objectives. And through it all, um, really promoting an enhancement and an improvement of our environment and the ecology of San Francisco Bay overall. Um, so we have really focused a lot of energy and resource on that. So with that 
open space network context, um, as I mentioned, we really strive to create a diversity of different types and forms of open space and public space improvements along the way. We want to make them walkable so that you can go from one to the next in approximately a five to 10 uh, minute uh, walking pace. And where there are those maritime industries, that's what makes the waterfront unique. That's what makes our open spaces unique. That's where we've of often tried to um, provide those opportunities. So you've got the open space spine. Then we add a variety of maritime and development opportunity locations, which are promoted in the waterfront plan and identified. And then you look at the neighborhood that you're in and start looking at what is the character of that neighborhood and how does that intermesh with the particulars of the port property in that section of the waterfront. And that was generally the formula that was laid out in the waterfront plan to try and promote waterfront revitalization projects that related with the immediate neighbor but also spoke to the larger city frame and integrated the open space with the maritime and the commercial and entertainment and uh, recreational opportunities. Um, as was mentioned, a lot of work has been done since the waterfront plan was first meant, uh, adopted on our historic resources and the Embarcadero Historic District is something that we're very proud of. That uh, it includes all the piers and bulkheads from Fisherman's Wharf at Pier 45 down to Pier 48, which is included within the Mission Rock uh, Giants project at, at, uh, just south of the uh, China Basin Channel. And um, for all of the port's historic resources, Secretary of the Interior Standards Compliance is a requirement. Um, the National Register listing of our historic districts affords the port and our development partners access to the federal historic tax credit as well, which is a very fundamental and key financing tool that has been required in order to be able to realize projects just like Pier 1, where we are now, or the, or the ferry building next door. Similarly, more recently, uh, we were happy to have the Pier 70 Union Ironworks Historic District also listed on the National Register. And as uh, many of you are aware, Orton Development Company is in the process now of trying to rescue that Union Ironworks machine shop, the 20th Street historic buildings that are the Grand Gateway into Pier 70, and the federal tax credits are fundamental to making those projects pencil. Uh, Forest City will be working on their project in Pier 70 also relying on the federal tax credit. The Waterfront Land Use Plan tries to organize the policies by breaking up the waterfront into five sub-areas. So as Bob Myers was noting, previous plans for the port's land were sub-area based, so is the Waterfront Land Use Plan, because they do break up into many different characteristics. And that's, the Waterfront Plan identifies objectives for each one of these uh, sub-areas, and um, then opportunity areas within each as well to give some more site-specific guidance as to what kinds of uh, developments and improvements should take place. But one thing to note, the Waterfront Land Use Plan is not trying to dictate specific development projects or outcomes. Um, there was a lot of discussion uh, in that Waterfront Plan process before about previous uh, plans for the port waterfront, some of which got very prescriptive, you know, X amount of square footage of this kind of use and Y amount of square footage of that kind of use. We did a whole review of the different types of plans that had been proposed for port property. And the conclusion from all of that was that the waterfront land use plan should provide a framework, a menu of uses for long-term improvement of the given properties, but should not drive specific outcomes because there was a recognition that those improvements would be happening over time and that there would be different port commissions, there would be different citizens, there would be different cultural and social changes, economic, political conditions that should be considered at the time a specific development project is undertaken. And so um, the, the 
Waterfront Plan Advisory Board was quite clear about providing a plan that had some flexibility in it, but also recognized that when you do get to that development project, there needed to be a specific process in place that enabled the public to engage about the details of the project at that time. And so while you can't read all of the little squares in this uh, flow chart, uh, it's uh, a means of trying to convey that the waterfront plan did set forth a site-specific development review process where the idea was the port commission would identify a given site and a design, uh, development concept that they thought would be appropriate to advance and explain why. And the port staff would create an advisory committee to be able to vet those ideas and to build in criteria that should be included in an RFP, a request for proposals from prospective developers so that um, the Port Commission and the public had a chance to weigh in about what the outlines of that development project opportunity should look like. And through that, the, it, the community advisory group would give that input, the port commission would uh, go through the RFP process, a developer selection would take place, and then the developer would come up with a proposal, hopefully as responsive as possible to those criteria in the RFP, and present that and go through the CEQA environmental review and the entitlement process and the community outreach project process that development projects go through in San Francisco. And whether you're on the advisory group at the time that the RFP is being conceptualized or you're reviewing the project as it's been proposed by your developer, there is a public process that provides for public uh, comment and uh, insertion about whatever the concerns are that the project should achieve. So that was the concept that was advanced with the waterfront plan. We went through a period of time where for each development project, we went through and dutifully created these advisory groups, sought their counsel, informed the RFP, and then selected the developer, and then we would disband those advisory groups until the next development project came along. And what we found was the on-again, off-again advisory group formation and closure got to be uh, cumbersome. And so we ended up evolving into the structure that we have now, where we have standing advisory groups for each of our areas of the waterfront that are represented here on this working group. The Fisherman's Wharf Advisory Group, the Northeast Waterfront Advisory Group, which actually covers two sub-areas, the Northeast Waterfront and the Ferry Building Waterfront. And then South Beach China Basin is one huge, um, uh, segment of the of the waterfront. It used to be that we would go with the redevelopment agency South Beach CAC to cover South Beach and then um, we went with the Central Waterfront Advisory Group to cover the areas to the south and Pier 70. Um, and so now we've sort of conformed into a Central Waterfront Advisory Group and we're in the process of adding in some South Beach uh, members so that we can regain you know, uh, an advisory group focus on this section of the waterfront. And then we have the Southern Waterfront Advisory Group looking at the port's maritime industrial complex. Told us and then covering all of that is the Maritime Commerce Advisory Committee that uh, Ellen Jonk harkens from to cover all the maritime activities that may span the seven and a half mile waterfront. And then we have you, the working group. So. We have no shortage of advisory groups at the port. <laughs> so <clears throat> for um, those of you who wanted to speak more to what the Waterfront Land Use Plan was and its review, as John noted, Prop H requires that uh, there be a review of the Waterfront Plan every five years to identify whether it's still providing current guidance or not. Uh, the last time that we completed that five-year review was in 2008. And then when it came time around uh, to do the five-year review again, um, our lovely executive director, Monique Moyer, said, I want more than five years. I want you to go back to the inception of the plan. And um, it was more than we bargained for, but we're really glad that we did. Um, many of the questions and issues that you may have about the waterfront plan or why it is, you're probably more likely to find it in the comprehensive review that we did in the summer of last year, 
We finalized it in June of this year after receiving a lot of public comments and doing a lot of public presentations about what the staff's review was of the projects, the accomplishments, the failures, the uh, discoveries that the Port Commission and its staff and the city have learned ever since the waterfront plan was, uh, you know, uh, approved in 1997. Um, so th the, this review, which has some preliminary recommendations in it, and the public discussions that happen up till June 2015 inform the policy issues that we have here before this working group today to focus on. Um, the details, both of these reports, the details of all of our analysis in the Port Commission staff reports are all online, www.sfport.com slash WLUP for Waterfront Land Use Plan. So without uh, rehashing all of the changes, this is kind of our summary of what is in that comprehensive review of the waterfront plan. There's been a significant amount of public and private investment. Uh, 63 new acres of waterfront parks have been created with another 40 on the way. A lot of work done uh, on our historic resources, a lot more to do. Um, and we've got a diversity of activities and now with uh, our prop you know, our, our projects down in, south of the channel with uh, Mission Rock and the Forest City project, completely new, different kinds of neighborhood development projects. So I won't go into all those details now, but uh, suffice to say that all of that information is on the website and in some of our brochure summaries out the door here, just outside. Um, but I guess I did want to just kind of, again, give rise to the uh, policy issues. Um, they, if you've had a chance to review this handout, which is available here for everyone tonight, um, I won't go into a great level of depth in this, but clearly resilience and climate change uh, is our big front and center issues for the Port Commission and the city. Um, I think that everybody is pretty familiar. We've heard through the Waterfront Vision session and some of the public comments that we've received from you that there is a very, very serious concern about that. The Port Commission layers on top of that are concerns about the stability of the seawall uh, in, the, in the event of a major earthquake. It's a formidable structure now. Uh, it's, it's, it's massive. But in the context of a major 8.0-ish uh, earthquake in the Bay Area uh, in, the, in the near term. There's a 75% chance of that happening within the next 30 years. So that's even sooner than some of the sea level rise concerns that we face. Uh, the Port Commission is really turning its attention to looking at that. So when you're looking at the seawall or you're looking at sea level rise, there's an intersection between those two uh, <coughs> types of concerns. And I think that's going to be a big part of our discussions in this process. Um, with respect to um, our historic resources and, and peer, peer facilities, um, our peers are aging. So if you layer that against some of these resilience questions and the cost associated with what it takes to do rehabilitation development projects like this, there's going to be a question about how much is realistically possible and what kinds of priorities might we make over the quality of historic preservation or the amount of public access or whether we can meet all of our maritime birthing needs. Um, so some of those are, are issues uh, on the up and coming for you. Um, maritime birthing and open space. We have seen really this blossoming of parks and open space in large part thanks to the voters of San Francisco. But we are running up against some concerns around being able to have enough space to birth vessels. Uh, some people want public access. Some people want to be able to pull up a vessel. We need to be able to look at a finer grain as to whether we can find ways to co have both of those public benefits coexist or if there are places where one has to take precedence over another. 
Transportation, huge concerns and comments about transportation. Tom touched the tip of that iceberg. We recognize that um, there's gonna be a lot of discussion about that. The Port Commission, Commissioner Wu Ho in particular, has really been uh, marshalling the port's efforts to grow water taxis and ferry service, water transportation as part of our role in that, as well as to look at the Embarcadero Promenade and some of our public realm improvements on the public spaces. Um, development, lots of questions around development. While we have a process that looks at how we integrate community input for competitively bid development project opportunities, where we have sole source proposals like the Exploratorium, the Warriors, other projects that come in without having a competitive bid process, there's questions about what the process should be for those types of projects and how the public interests for uh, that kind of opportunity should be uh, collected. Um, and finances, we will be talking a lot about money. Um, all of this costs money and there's not enough of it. Uh, and yet we have to try and maintain a waterfront that is safe, that provides enough personal security to keep it as attractive and, uh, as it is, um, and to in improve the environment. Uh, we're integrating as many measures to improve environmental sustainability as part of our operations with shoreside power and stormwater management, but there are still innovations uh, in the four that we want to be prepared for and incorporate into our policy framework. In addition to those port-wide policy issues, we also um, have focused in on two particular areas of the waterfront because most of the remaining long-term development opportunity sites that uh, the port staff thinks are still viable or the sites that are the most challenging and we don't know if they're viable are in the Northeast waterfront and the South Beach sections of the waterfront. And uh, in the aftermath of the Warriors proposal down at Pier 3032, or some of the development controversies up in the Northeast waterfront area, the staff had recommended that we take a finer grain neighborhood scale look at those two sections of the waterfront because uh, we think that there are just some fundamental points that may need to be reframed in the waterfront plan. For the other sub areas, it's not like there isn't stuff left to do and we will be uh, providing more materials uh, on the waterfront plan on, on what's left to do. Um, the ferry building, for example, you know, we're talking about trying to improve a plaza where the farmer's market is or the agriculture building, which is a precious resource. Fisherman's Wharf, we also are looking at how we can further public access improvements and address some of our BCDC uh, regulatory needs up there. And down in the southern waterfront, we're looking at an e expanding our eco-industrial leasing strategy so that cargo shipping and complementary synergistic industrial uses continue to have a home in San Francisco. So the timeline for the public process, many of you may be generally familiar, but we've tried to add a little bit more uh, definition in the timeline. We are in part one of the waterfront working group process. We have suggested this sequence of topics they're initially providing some orientation. We, it's hard to talk about these policy issues until you've gotten some basic level of orientation on all of these topics. So the meetings are to provide information, to provide the co community a chance to understand them on the topic, but also in context. And maybe you might have some initial ideas about what the port should be considering. But the policy discussions, what you make of all the information that you learn in part one, we're gonna ask you in part two, sometime in summer of next year, to start putting together your recommendations about what kinds of priorities and directions the port should be taking on those policy issue questions. And by October of next year, as we've proposed it in this calendar, we would look to see that, we, we would look for recommendations coming from the working group with discussions with the advisory teams and the public about how to address those policy issues, 
then take some time to go through that sub-area planning for the Northeast Waterfront and the South Beach. Many of these port-wide issues will probably influence the thinking about what should be considered in the sub-area planning. And then you have sort of a wrap-up session to kind of coagulate that into one package and send it forward to the port staff. The port staff, it's our job and responsibility to take the recommendations and public comments that we get about how the waterfront plan amendments should be crafted and what they should address. And that we'll be tasked with the, the duty of trying to come up with some draft amendments to the waterfront plan. They could involve and they probably will involve new sections dealing with things like climate change. Um, so to answer your question, Tom, Yes, you can, you can add and change, you can add and change some of the goals, you can add and change some of the policies as they relate to these policy issues that we've flagged. And those draft amendments would then be brought out to the public. For public comment, it would be going to the Port Commission, this working group will do a whole community cover on that. Uh, and there's going to be environmental review and, and all of that that goes along before the Port Commission would be in a position to be able to take any action to amend the waterfront plan, including the design and access element. And I guess I would just note at this point that as staff, you know, if you have gone through the waterfront land use plan, congratulations. It's a very lengthy document. It's kind of <coughs> verbose. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of obsolete information in there that was just trying to report what was happening at the time that, frankly, the staff, we would like to go back and really kind of do a good cleansing to really focus in on the information that's current and relevant for the policies that we would be proposing at that time. And just in terms of the process itself, um, we've, you know, we've been trying to explain to uh, the public what this working group does, and hopefully this presentation is helping you to understand the policy issues that we're asking the working group to review, but these advisory teams providing this focus or expertise on all of these different topics, port staff, I expect that we will be reaching out to advisory teams to help inform some of these orientation presentations, as well as follow-up questions and tasks that come out of these meetings where we would want to be able to zero in a little bit deeper on some of these topics and then report them back at the, wor at the working group so that the working group can consider how that might affect their recommendations. We are also working with, it's not just port staff as I mentioned, we um, are working with a family of uh, public agencies as well. Uh, state lands, uh, California State Lands Commission staff and BCDC uh, Commission staff is also have slots on this working group. They were not able to make the meeting tonight, unfortunately. But where you have public trust questions or things that relate to those agencies, we wanted to be able to give you a direct dialogue opportunity with them. And so uh, we work with them, we work with the planning department, SFMTA, PUC, DBW, Mayor's Office of uh, uh, Workforce and Oper Office and Workforce Development, and uh, the Sea Level Rise um, Task Force. So there's a number of different agencies that we're trying to bring in on the topics that relate to them. And in the meantime, there are still projects that were initiated <coughs> before the waterfront plan review process was done. So we have you know, obligations to tenants or we've got timelines for spending money to make certain improvements, whether they be for maritime, open space, or real estate leasing kinds of activities. So uh, we just want to be clear that there are going to be projects going forward. Each of them have their own public process and co public comment opportunities, either through the Port Commission, Port Advisory Committees, Board of Supervisors, Planning Commission. And so if you are interested in any of those, please Please contact the port staff and we will help uh, help you guide that way. But those project specifics are not going to be scheduled for discussion by the working group because those processes already exist. So with that, um, <laughs> thank you for sitting through the presentation. Um, we are happy to take questions. Thank you, Diane. And, uh for those of you who were involved in the effort back in the, when the first 
version of a waterfront land use plan was developed. Thank you, because you left us with a very, very comprehensive and good document that is now in need of some uh, amendment, but it is basically a uh, highly productive uh, effort, and we appreciate it. Some of you probably, hold on a second, some of you probably have given some thought to the end process here and how Diane has mentioned recommendations and so <coughs> forth, and I just, we've talked a little bit about how we formulate whatever it is we're going to say at the end of this process, and as you think about it, I think Janice and my current belief, along with the staff, is that we're not going to try to force an issue to a majority vote or to a vote of any kind. If there is a substantial or substantive disagreement, our guess at this point is that we will present the various positions in our report to the staff. I don't know that we want to engage in debate on a roll call vote. I, I, I tend to want to avoid that in a planning document. So I think that's where we're going to be. So if you're thinking about how do we end all of this, it will be in a report and recommendations. If we don't achieve consensus, as I hope we will, at least on most issues, we will then represent the prevailing points of view as best we can and let the port select from that. So oh, I just wanted to have that in your mind so you don't worry about how, how, who votes on what and how we, how we move along with that. Uh, uh, I think the next, we have a little bit of time, we are going to run a little short, but we have a little bit of time to <coughs> get questions, comments directed either at Janice or I or at the port staff about this presentation and where we go from there. Uh, before I forget it, one thing about the schedule, uh, Diane, if you have a chance. To the extent I have a feeling about what comes where, I would like to have the port staff think about moving finances and capital planning up so that that is not dragging <coughs> at the tail end. I, I don't think we can, I, I don't think that it's makes sense. There. I think we need to know a little bit about what's planned and what the resources are before, yeah. we, before we get to that. So if you can sort of jiggle that up a little bit, that would be helpful. Okay, questions from the audience. Yes, Corinne. Actually, just some suggestions. Um, there are almost either monthly or uh, every other month meetings of the advisory groups, which do address the specific sub-areas. And if this group isn't already on the mailing list for those meetings, I would suggest that they be put on, because that way, if members of this working group want us to get caught up on northeast waterfront, central waterfront, southern waterfront, whatever, maritime, uh, they can go to those meetings and get a much <clears throat> more detailed uh, context. The other thing I'm suggesting is um, the commission staff reports on various issues like sea level rise, whatever, are extremely helpful. Uh, these are presentations made to the Port Commission. Um, they're really hard to find. If you're looking for a specific topic, you can find it with Google sometimes, but if there's a, a discussion of sea level rise or seawall and planning, a link to the specific staff report so that we don't spend all our time looking for this stuff would be very helpful. Yeah, may, may I strongly second that staff? I, I don't want to have to go to the port site and look through hours of stuff trying to find something. If there's something that you guys as staff think we ought to know, I'll send us a link a specific link to it because otherwise we're just never going to see it, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Corinne. Yes, others? Other questions? Yes, Ms. Turner. I have two comments and a request. The first comment is that um, I thought that the uh, plan review was an excellent document and I really, I can't say I enjoyed reading it, but it was very interesting. <laughs> Spent a lot of time looking things up, you know, de for definitions and stuff. Anyway, thank you for that. Um, the second <coughs> comment is that I'm really looking forward to the governance session in January, because frankly, I am lost. 
uh, on all of this. It's very complicated. <laughs> and the third you um, don't know the half is of it. A, what? You don't know the half of it. Right? <laughs> the third is, a, and I'm an experienced bureaucrat. I mean, I know how California works, honestly. Uh, this is amazing. On the seawall, I've gotten very interested in this, and I am so hoping that at some point we could have a presentation by engineers about what we're really talking about on the seawall. People keep talking about the seawall, but then you see a picture of a pier. Uh, that's not the seawall. Anyway, uh, I would really like to be briefed in detail on that. The staff will take due note. Yes, Ms. Richardson. She nodded, I saw her. I just wanted to say that um, I definitely agree that we need to move uh, the finances up. One thing that I would also like to have another category, um, there is a difference between finances and capital improvement. And the reason I'm pushing for capital improvement overall to be a separate category is informed by a task force that I was part of that had already set precedent uh, for San Francisco, uh, which is the San Francisco Public Utility Commission, in which the Hetch Hetchy and all of that, that there was uh, designated a task force to look at the capital improvements, given the fact that uh, the PUC is an enterprise agency like the port, they did not have the money for anything. And so that task force actually, by focusing on the capital improvement led to the rest of history, what we have right now, billions and billions of dollars um, that the city was able to justify now that is now dealing with um, Hetch Hetchy. And in one of the previous uh, meetings that we had on the waterfront uh, plan, the first meeting, I think it was one of the members here that <coughs> says that the port is, is San Francisco number one prime asset. So the city now recognizes the importance of the infrastructure improvement and the capital allocation for Hetch Hetchy. Then now is the time for us to, uh, through this working body, elevate that and let the city now justify for the massive uh, capital improvement that's gonna be needed. It's not just finances, which is based on the current revenue, but so I would like no. to add that in. Yeah, no, you, you're absolutely right. And when we talk about finances, I think we're trying to find what, what at least what I had in mind, perhaps I should have said that more explicitly, is how do we finance the capital improvements that we need to undertake? And there is an update on the port's capital plan that is available. And for those of you who want to take a look at it, if uh, there's a link to it that I think Diane can furnish to you. But I, th I think that is a very informative, a very informative and somewhat frightening document. Yes. <laughs> Tom? Yes. Yep. So um, a few comments and then a question. One is uh, on the finance, I think it's important at least to know um, if that enterprise department model is, you know, if, if that's the lines we have to color within, right? So everything has to be self-sustaining. Um, I've noticed in the last few years, the voters have voted to put capital money from the city's general fund from bonds into the port, so it's not a closed financial system. Um, I, I'm, I would be worried that we could say, all right, well, let's, let's plan the, the port improvements that we can pay for, but it's not the, the port that pe the public wants, or we can plan the port the public wants and tell them how much it would take to pay for it. Yeah, believe me, so if I, if, I hope if, we'll at least be able to think big and then figure out how to pay for it. If I've got okay. anything to do with it, it's not gonna be within that box. Okay, fantastic. Um, the other uh, thing is biodiversity. I'd, I'd like to see that highlighted somehow uh, in the port. There's some real success stories. Heron's Head Park and the Pier 96 wetlands. It doesn't really appear uh, in, the, in the waterfront land use plan, but uh, a lot of other waterfront, uh, and a lot of other cities are thinking about environmental restoration and biodiversity um, as everything from protecting from sea level rise to, to real assets. So I'd like to see those somehow reflected in the plan. Can one of the staff people talk to Tom about that? Okay. Um, lastly, I, I read in the paper that um, the, uh, the, the folks from the mayor's office who are working on the uh, a proposed Warriors Arena have said, oh yeah, well, you know, we've got overflow parking for them on port property. There was a, a parking lot at uh, uh, Crane Cove Park and there's one down up here at tw uh, 25th Street. And so, yeah, we can just put overflow parking on the port property. I thought, well, one, that's a really dumb use of waterfront public land. Secondly, aren't we supposed to be planning the waterfront? So I'm wondering what's gonna kind of, 
I, I would hate to see the port enter into some kind of binding or long-term commitment, uh, for, especially for a boneheaded use like surface parking, uh, until we're done with our work. So I'm kind of wondering what, what is actually going to wait for, the, uh, for this process and uh, what isn't. Uh, anybody want to take that? I'll try to answer that. Uh, explain <coughs> boneheaded move. Um, no, what we are what we are talking about in terms of the surface parking that would be available for the uh, for the uh, and support the arena if it's needed. Uh, is related to areas that are actual development sites that we will be talking about as uh, part of this process, but that one of the things coming back to the point was made about our being self-sustaining, a lot of the revenue that we get in the short term is from interim use of land for parking. And we're trying to take advantage of that. So while we have this land available, we haven't made decisions about exactly how we're going to develop it, if we can make it available for parking in the interim and there's a demand for it related to the arena, that's, that's what we're trying to address. But it's not saying that, that, um, that that's ultimately the, the long-term term use. And we're hoping that we can work with the arena as we've worked with the with the Giants in the past to become more efficient, to provide more transportation uses, to up the transportation use of people getting to the arena and take pressure off the parking, but the arena hasn't opened yet. They're nervous, they're concerned about what the demands might be, and of course they want to make sure that their uh, valves or the availability of, of parking uh, until people get more comfortable with using public transit and other ways of getting to the to their games and to their other activities at the arena. Yeah. Also, uh, Tom, I know you know my thoughts on transportation, uh, but also I think that the port has provided this ongoing port projects to continue, and so I feel like if those, concer those concerns should be addressed through those processes, but certainly for our policy recommendations and how we respond to policy issues such as land use or transportation, I think that's a uh, great grounds for us, you know, to yeah. change future. I, I guess it's a question of what's an ongoing project, right? That, that seems to have popped up in the last few months and, and it just seemed like, all right, that, that yeah, not right. Yeah, and so maybe if the port can give a little bit more detail to what is or isn't properly included here, because I see one of the, I see one of them just lists more blue greenway open spaces, and I actually think that the parking lots that were randomly referenced mm -hmm. um, actually may fall underneath that. So having a little bit more detail to exactly what these ongoing port projects are would be helpful. The only thing I, thing I can add to that is I think most of us would feel that it would be awfully nice if the port and the commission could sort of preserve as many options for us as possible while you deal with the pressure that you always get from other city officials who, <laughs> who have designs on port properties, which uh, we are all only too familiar with. So. I guess, Diane, to the extent you can say, well, we're in the middle of this planning process, maybe we can make that commitment now. If you got the ability to do that, I think we would like that. We're happy to provide more details. There are staff reports that give the specific projects, and then there's a chapter in this waterfront review report on ongoing projects, so you can look at that section. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah. I just want, I mean, that was. Mostly my, my question really more at the bottom of that same chart, which is the development projects. And I brought this up at the Port Commission this last week and just wanted to recognize here, this is different in significant way than the waterfront plan process part one, which as was mentioned, the, you know, per the voters, froze the approval of new projects until the plan was done. You know, we're not under that mandate here. I do think as the chair, co-chair stated, I'm hoping the port recognizes we're trying to engage in a credible process, and so I hope a warrior's type project doesn't drop out of the blue, it goes forward, and we're left with a whole set of peers we thought we were trying to work out that have just been taken out from us. The only thing I will mention, the commissioners or the director did respond to me um, last week that 
if any of the projects listed, and I'm not going to be specific, but if you look at the list, you know the, the, probably the one I'm, I have in mind um, goes away during the course of our process and the developer you know, moves on. Um, I do hope we fold that in immediately to our process so we can do, hopefully plan something good there. Thank you. Um, yes, Ms. Wickman. Um, I guess I need a little bit of clarity. I'm not asking for it now, but maybe it can be worked into the next session on governance. Because um, I'm hearing about the ordinance, um, and it sounds like we uh, there's an understanding that we will adhere to the um, provisions of the ordinance that laid out the, the requirement for the land use plan. And then we have the land use plan from 1997 that's been updated and so on. And there are certain elements of that that can be changed. And I guess I'm a little confused about what can and can't be changed and what, what it is that we are expected, what has to be adhered to, and then what are those elements that we can propose changes to if we choose to do that. So it might be helpful to have that laid out for us at the next meeting where here are the things that exist in the ordinance and can't be changed, and here are the things that you would be able to, um, to make changes to if you choose to. Yeah, I, I think that would be a, a worthwhile project. I, I think, and uh, Mr. Dolger can speak for himself, but I think that the, the, the issue of what can and cannot be changed is something that will have to be addressed ultimately by the commission and by the board when it gets there. It, it is not implausible for us to suggest that something be changed that is within the ordinance, but the fact that we may suggest it and point out that the ordinance says such and such and so, but conditions have now changed that perhaps one ought to take a look at it, that I think is within our purview, and I don't think John would, uh, would say that that's impossible. So we can't change anything. All we can make is recommendations <coughs> to the extent that good sense prevails and we aren't going to throw out the whole ordinance, but if there's something that says time has come to take a look at that, there's nothing to prevent us from saying that, if that helps. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yes. Mr. Chair, Alan Jock, I would like to have us think, uh, think big. And when I say uh, think big, I am reminded of a wonderful photograph of the day after the earthquake in 1906 in this city. It was at the California Historical Society exhibit uh, earlier this year, or last year. And it shows, it was a picture taken from a blimp in the skies over San Francisco Bay. And the entire city is in smoke and rubble, it's at night. And what is the most active the port. activity uh, is this port. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Monique said at the beginning of this meeting, that this port is the definition of the city today for commerce, transportation, tourism, uh, the environment. And to, if we can think about that and come up as we think about our recommendations and what needs to be changed, what are the gaps, uh, I, I'd really encourage us to, to think about that um, in, in that way. And the second thing I have is, we have these external factors. We have the State Lands Commission. We have BCDC. We have uh, Army Corps of Engineers. We, we have Water Board. I would really, and we have the supervisors and the mayor's office. I would really encourage those people who are on the committee attached to a working group to encourage them, and I will do my best to encourage them to attend these meetings because we're going to have to, at some point, be working through them. Um, as, as well. It, we're all attached. So those are my two thoughts for the, for the group. Thank you. Thank you. We are cl cl very close to the end of this meeting, and uh, if there anybody, I, I'd like to give those who are not sitting at the table an opportunity to have a quick say. Anybody out there who wishes to be heard? Anybody wishes to be heard? Yes, sir. Briefly, please. Well, there have been several mentions of the seawall tonight and the aging seawall. I understand that there's an engineering study going on of the seawall, and I would like somebody to say something about that study and when it's going to become public. Okay, I, I don't know if this is the time to do so. Very briefly, can somebody refer to the study that's going on and when perhaps in our schedule we would be looking at that issue? Brad, is that you? 
So there was a report to the Port Commission um, in, at the November Port Commission meeting, um, just describe, giving the commission an update about that engineering analysis of the seawall. It's primarily a seismic study. Um, uh, the report then is that the results of that study are being peer reviewed right now. Um, we expect that sometime in the beginning of next year, the report will be released and we'll be sure to report back to you on it. And I think another member of the working group asked for an engineering uh, uh, and uh, port engineers to come and talk about the seawall and that is within uh, part of our plan. Thank you. And just to add to that, we plan to do that in March or April um, right now and that's on your schedule. We have planned that that will probably take at least two meetings because it's going to be such a Thank you. subject. Okay, the last item on the agenda, and we are going to wrap this up, is uh, the next meeting, which will be on governance, as you know, and it will include some uh, discourse about the ordinance and what is possible within that ordinance and what constraints are imposed upon us by outside agencies. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all there. Before we close, I'd like to give Janice a chance to I've monopolized this mic for too long. Oh, I have nothing to add, so uh, let's close this meeting. <laughs> okay. <laughs>